Good afternoon. I'm Karen Engel, and I teach at the University of Texas School of Law, and I co-direct, along with Neville Hode, the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice, as well as the new Sissy Farenthold Fund for Peace and Social Justice. The event today and next Monday, titled Strategies for Reproductive Justice in Texas After the End of Roe v. Wade, from the local to the global, that's the umbrella for both events, will serve to inaugurate the Sissy Farenthold Fund. As many of you know, Sissy passed away last September, just shy of the age of 95. And many people have generously donated to the fund to support issues to which she was committed, including reproductive justice. And um, Nina Evner is going to be putting some links in the chat for you all along the way. Um, you'll be able to save them at the end so you don't need to get distracted. Um, but we'll use the chat for that pur purpose. And just to say now, if you have questions, we ask that you post them in the Q&A. And if you're watching on YouTube, please post the questions there and one of our students will communicate them to the panelists. So I wanna thank um, not only the contributors to the fund, but this eminent group of speakers who have agreed to be in discussion with us today. I'm also grateful to Jacob Bloss, uh, the Rappaport Center Program Coordinator, as well as our postdoctoral fellow and amazing summer student team who jumped into action immediately after the ruling in Dobbs, and actually they started before then to help plan this and future events and activities. Um, I also want to thank Lulu Flores, who will soon be in the Texas legislature fighting the good fight um, for helping me reach out to some of the speakers today. Now, this roundtable is a fitting inauguration for the Sissy Farenthold Fund for a number of reasons. So for those of you who might not know, Sissy was a politician, including as a progressive leader in the Texas House of Representatives from 1969 to 73, and she ran a galvanizing campaign for governor in 1972. As the first chair of the National Women's Political Caucus, she became an important voice for abortion rights, especially for poor women. And she was for decades a grassroots activist on a number of issues. Now, Sissy could have used the same title of this event in 1977, when she began a speech, quote, I come to you today with as great a sense of grievance and injustice as of indignation, and with anguish as well as anger over the recent course of events as regards the constitutional right to abortion. Now in that speech again in 1977, she said she thought that Roe had solved the problems of reproductive choice, but in fact, Roe had already been undermined by all three branches of government through limited access to abortion that excluded poor women and women of color. So today in part one of this event, Blue Zones, Red State, Strategies for Ensuring Abortion Access in Texas, we consider not only multiple branches of the federal government, but also government action at the state and local level, with an eye toward the question of what strategies can be pursued at each level. In many ways, the impetus for this event is my friend and colleague who's here um, and native Texan, Rachel Rebuchet, who is a leading reproductive health and family law scholar and interim dean and professor of law at Temple University. I asked her to help me put the roundtables together after reading her co-authored article written before the Dobbs decision and just updated this past weekend entitled The New Abortion Battleground. The piece anticipated the end of Roe and in fact was cited by the dissenters. And the authors of the piece, Rachel and her co-authors explain, quote, while most commentators are focusing on what a post-row world looks like within individual states, this article examines the challenging legal issues that will arise across state borders and between the state and federal government. Even as we look at what can and can't be done within the state today, the state of Texas, we do so with an eye toward how that might affect and be affected by what happens elsewhere. So in order to see this jurisdictional overlay most clearly, we decided for this first panel to invite elected officials who represent residents of Austin and Travis County at different levels of government. So I'll briefly introduce the speakers now, since most of you know who they are. 
Um, Representative Donna Howard has served in the Texas House of Representatives since 2006, where she also chairs the Texas Women's Health Caucus. A critical care nurse by training, she has long been a strong supporter and advocate of reproductive health and justice, as well as of a number of other issues, including low income housing and education. Thank you for being here, Representative Howard. Council member Vanessa Fuentes is an Austin City Council member where she has served since 2021. She brings a background in criminal justice reform as well as health advocacy to her work at the council where she's fought already for healthier communities, housing rights, food access, and racial justice. So thank you, council members, for being with us today as well. And I'll just say a word about Lloyd Doggett, um, which is that he's been a member of Congress for 27 years, mostly representing communities in Austin and San Antonio, probably represented more than any other member of Congress because they keep changing his congressional lines. Um, Perhaps of relevance today, so we'll have to remind him when he comes on, uh, before serving in the U.S. House, he also uh, served in the Texas Senate and was a justice on the Texas Supreme Court. So since we're looking at what blue zones can possibly do within this red state, I thought we'd start with Councilmember Fuentes and then move up the jurisdictional ladder. So, Councilmember, the city of Austin, along with Travis County, has long been at the forefront of progressive thinking in the country on a number of issues. Using its blue city status to provide its citizens with protections and resources that the state and sometimes even the federal government will not. So it makes good sense that, and, and first I'll say that the, the Travis County District Attorney Jose Garza who will be with us next week. Um, it makes good sense that he said he won't prosecute those providing or accessing abortion in Travis County. And that you and some of your count, fellow council members have proposed a resolution on abortion access called the GRACE Act, which I gather you'll vote on later this month. So could you tell us what the GRACE Act will do and specifically what assurances you think the resolution will or should provide to those who might wanna perform, support, or seek abortion services in Austin? And, and maybe just a quick welcome uh, to, to Congressman. Um, we, we've, we've introduced you already, um, and people are ready to ask you questions about your time on the Texas Supreme Court. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. It's great to join uh, uh, colleagues that are making such a big difference in the Austin City Council and uh, at the state legislature against great odds. Um, all right, Council Member Fuentes, tell us about the GRACE Act. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much, first and foremost, for <clears throat> hosting today's conversation. It, is, uh, you know, unfortunately we have to have this conversation, but I know how needed and important for us to have these type of conversations because like many policymakers at all different levels, I can imagine we are all getting so many inquiries and, and messages from our constituents wanting to know more, wanting to know what we are doing and especially at the local level. As you mentioned, Austin has a history in supporting access to abortion. We were one of the first cities in the country to establish an abortion access fund where we provided funding uh, for travel, for childcare, for, for hotel vouchers, uh, for anyone seeking abortions. And um, I as well propose an ordinance change to the city's non-discrimination ordinance that will uh, protect reproductive choices as part of our non-discrimination ordinance. And that will also be part of next week's special called meeting where we will consider the GRACE Act. And so the GRACE Act is policy brought forward by my colleague, Councilman Bertito Vela. And what it seeks to do is to decriminalize abortion care in Austin. It has two main components. One, it would ensure that no city funds or City of Austin resources are used in cataloging or investigating reports of abortion care in the city. And two, it would recommend that our Austin Police Department place these abortion reports as their lowest possible priority. You know, these alleged crimes, we want to ensure that this is the lowest level priority for, for our police. We know that their uh, time and resources is better spent investigating, uh, you know, violent crime, not abortions. And so the Austin City Council will be considering that policy, that legislation next week during a special call meeting. Um, 
what I want to also share is that these efforts are not exclusive to Austin. We are building a momentum throughout the state and throughout other states throughout the country. Um, I serve as the chair of the Local Progress, which is a network of local elected officials throughout the country. And we are seeing similar legislation to the Grace Act that Austin will consider uh, being considered in other cities and other municipalities and has in fact already passed. So the city of Denton here in Texas was the first city to pass the Grace Act um, Atlanta, Nashville, and most recently New Orleans has also passed similar le legislation that seeks to decriminalize abortion. And as you mentioned, we're very fortunate here in Travis County and having our district attorney already publicly commit that he will not uh, seek to prosecute um, these instances. And so uh, this is just a little bit of what the city of Austin is committed to doing when it comes to protect, protecting reproductive choices. And uh, certainly we'll continue to do more as needed, but just wanted to share a little bit more about the upcoming policy. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to ask you a follow-up, which I'm glad you mentioned that the city of Denton um, had passed a similar resolution. And we know San Antonio is considering one. Um, the El Paso City Council just de de declined to pass one. And one of the key votes, I understand the person who cast it, um, said that was partly out of preemption concerns. Um, and paying attention to the extent to which the state of Texas, the Texas legislature has in fact often preempted some of the very progressive legislation that you, uh, at a local level, that you talked about. Um, but you and your co-sponsors thought a lot about the issue of preemption um, in drafting this resolution. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how you've treated that. Um, and also maybe to tell us, even if, even if the act or the resolution isn't preempted, um, do you think that abortion providers and seekers might still face risks? You, one thing we should never underestimate is Republican legislatures using Texas as a testing ground for dangerous policies. And certainly we've already have heard and seen uh, state lawmakers go on record already saying that they are seek they will be seeking to uh, further, uh, you know, take away the tools in the toolbox for localities throughout the state. And so we know that this is going to be at the top of their wish list is to continue to further erode the rights of, of women throughout this state. Um, but the reality is, is that we have a responsibility to continue to do everything that we can at this moment to have protections for Austinites. And regardless of the threats that we see, we are doing what, what is in the best interest of our communities and what our communities are asking for at this time. Um, with the policy that we're considering that seeks to decriminalize abortion, we have checked with our, our legal team. We've double checked, triple checked, and we are within state law. And so we know that um, that what we're doing is sound and, and that it is legal. Uh, it is a policy recommendation to our police department and to the city manager. Um, but we know that, that the state legislature will continue to undermine our rights. And so uh, for us, um, we'll continue as they continue to fight, we'll continue to fight back and we'll think creatively and we'll, we'll think outside of the box. But the important piece here is that we work in concert with other municipalities throughout the state. Our strength is in numbers. And that's why you're seeing cities like San Antonio, like Austin, like like Denton uh, and others, you know, I'm hearing from other cities that they are doing the same thing we are, but they're not going to pass a public policy. They're going to do it um, behind the scenes, you know, so we are seeing movement uh, created throughout the state. And I think that will really help us in bolstering protections that we can provide to, to Texans at this time. All right. Um, that's, I, I, I like the the strength in numbers, and it's good to hear about other cities who maybe haven't come out, haven't been outspoken about what they're doing, but knowing that they are, and it seems like that's also important information, right, to make sure that people learn about, and uh, especially people who live in those in those municipalities. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's also a good segue um, to Representative Howard and and thinking about what state lawmakers. Um, might do, might want to do. Um, but 
I think before we get to the bleakness of that, um, I'd like to start uh, by asking you, Representative Howard, you, you've been a fearless fighter for abortion rights and reproductive health more broadly at the Texas legislature for over two decades. Um, and most recently, uh, you opposed SB8, restricting abortion to six weeks, SB4, prohibiting medication abortions after seven weeks. And in December 2021, um, after both of those bills had passed and after the Supreme Court heard the arguments in Dobbs, uh, the Texas Women's Health Caucus put out a statement um, and you said, quote, if the court fails to affirm a person's right to choose and if states are allowed to force a person to remain pregnant against their will, equal status for all Americans will be eroded. The Supreme Court's decision in this case will determine the very future of our nat nat nation. So here we are, and you're headed back into the legislative session. And as I said, we're, we're not going to get to the bleakness yet, although that was pretty bleak. But I want to give you a chance to talk about um, any legislation, uh, including that which touches upon reproductive justice more generally, um, that you or other caucus members might propose or promote in light of the Dobbs decision. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um... I'm looking at, at Lloyd Doggett here. We go way back, pre-Roe v. Wade. <laughs> we know what it was like. Um, and certainly um, the, the statement that you referred to, um, absolutely, when you do not have uh, self-determination, uh, you do not have the ability to participate equally in, in a democratic society. And certainly we know over the past half century that women, because they have been able to determine if and when they want to have a pregnancy, want to have a family, uh, they've been able to achieve certain things uh, educationally and employment-wise that they might not have been able to achieve otherwise contributing to our society. So um, this is a great concern and it's hard not to talk about the bleakness because that surrounds all of this, but at the same time to your re request here, <laughs> focusing on what we can do. Uh, in a limited uh, way, we can move forward on some things. Obviously, we are the minority party that are supportive of uh, reproductive justice. Uh, and so it, there are limited things, but there are some very profound things that we can do. And uh, I'm hoping that my colleagues will, will join me, those that say that they are supportive of life and supportive of moms and babies. We have a lot of work to do in Texas to make sure that uh, we're putting our money where our mouths are about that. Um, obviously, we have one of the highest maternal morbidity and mortality rates, not only in the country, but in the world, in the developed world. Um, we also have uh, a high, we're in the top, uh, I think probably the top 10 states in terms of teen pregnancy, but the top state in terms of a repeat <laughs> teen pregnancies. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we know that there are things that we can do, even though we haven't expanded Medicaid, that could provide better coverage. So some specific things that we're going to be working on, obviously fighting back on some of the negative things that we will talk about here. But on the positive side, uh, we want to make sure that those that are eligible for women's health programs in our state, that we fully fund those programs. Right now, the last figure I had seen, only about 20% of eligible women were participating in those programs. Uh, we know that uh, we need to expand uh, postpartum uh, Medicaid coverage. Over half the births in Texas are Medicaid. Uh, we need to make sure if we're gonna have more pregnancies, and we're gonna have more babies and moms that are carrying those pregnancies, uh, that we need to make sure that they not only have healthy pregnancies, but postpartum are able to get the healthcare they need to support that family that they're gonna be having. Uh, we in the legislature, uh, did vote uh, for six month extension from two months in the last legislative session. Uh, the House, I have to say, did vote for the full one year postpartum, but the Senate wouldn't go for that. So it was a six month extension. That hasn't been implemented yet because it's just recently been submitted to CMS uh, and, and as a waiver. So we're still operating under the two month uh, regardless of the public health emergency, that complicates things. Bottom line is we need to expand to, to 12 months postpartum. Um, we are one of only two states that doesn't provide reimbursement for contraceptives for those that are in the CHIP program. 
uh, that is ridiculous on so many levels and uh, certainly not cost effective. Uh, we need to make sure that teens are getting access to the contraceptives that they need uh, to be able to continue to pursue their education and hopefully become productive citizens and then have a family when they're ready to have one. Um, you know, th there are so many things that we could do to make sure that we are fully funding the coverage that people need for providing the tools that they need. Access to contraceptives is huge. Uh, providing the kind of sex education in the classrooms that is going to help provide students with what they need to make healthy, responsible choices. I could go into more, but those are some of the things I think we're really gonna be focused on. Uh, I will say one more thing because we're talking about reproductive justice. The fact is that women of means have always been able to have access to abortion care if they could travel and get to it. That's a huge concern here because so many people are not able to travel. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have to be looking, and we've been talking with the White House and other states on a national level to see what we can strategically do to work with others to ensure that, that those, especially those of limited means, are not deprived of access in states where it will remain legal. Thank you for that. And um, just a little bit of a shout out for next week's panel um, on the 18th of five, because that's one of the things that we'll be focusing on too, is what are the possibilities for people going out of state and certainly those who don't have resources. Um, I, I mean, maybe I, a, a couple of questions to follow up. One is I, I'm wondering if you think that you'll be able to get um, some Republicans to support the legislation that you just talked about. So sounds like you had some support in the House uh, last term with the postpartum extension. Are there are these kind of strategically designed to be able to pull them on board? Um, and then secondly, we'll let you get to the blatantness um, about, uh, you know, what are your concerns about legislation that Republicans are likely to pursue? Including those that, and, and there are a couple, there are a few questions in the chat now, and I think folks were sort of, will we'll be addressing them indirectly, if not directly, but somebody asked what preemption meant, so um, apologize if I wasn't clear about that, but certainly the question would be, right, can the state um, keep the city and county from doing uh, what it what it's hoping to do, what it's claiming it's doing, what it's, if the resolution passes, um, and then we'll talk about that at a higher level um, or the next level up when we get to the federal, um, can the federal preempt some of the state legislation. But, um, but let's talk about what, what are we gonna be concerned about? What are we expecting to see? Um, what, are you most, what are you most worried about? Uh, the list is long. Um, Roe v. Wade was nowhere near the end of this journey. There are many things already being proposed and I, I, I'm not looking at the chat right now, but I think my one of my, my uh, chief of staff is gonna put in the chat a link to a letter that just got sent out uh, past couple of days uh, from the Texas Freedom Caucus uh, to a major law firm in Dallas uh, with all kinds of threats of what they are proposing to do. I mean, part of what's happening here is, uh, you know, unfortunately the pre-Roe statutes were never repealed and they're still in the books. I will say that representative at the time, Sarah Weddington, after Roe, did actually have legislation that would have repealed those statutes and it didn't pass. Uh, that being said, the, the Attorney General has made an interpretation that we are now under 1925 legislation uh, and has effectively uh, prevented, even though we're still, even though we still should be operating under Senate Bill 8, which provides, allows for abortions up to six weeks, um, it's, it's basically had a, a chilling effect on providers being cautious about liability. Uh, funds that help women access abortion outside of our state, they're not able to utilize those funds for that purpose at this point in time with the threat that's, that's going on. Um, the Freedom Caucus members who signed on to this letter, you know, if it's in the chat, hopefully you can get a chance to look at it yourself, but um, you know, things that are, have never been proposed before, like disbarring lawyers who, uh, who actually help their employees access abortion health care outside of the state, um, prohibiting travel, telling businesses what they can and cannot do. This is supposedly 
a group of people who are for limited government, limited regulation, and they are overreaching to the maximum uh, what can be done here. They, they, they are telling businesses how to operate and, and sending cease and desist letters and that sort of thing. So yes, we've seen, they've given us a preview. Uh, there's talk of uh, more criminalization going on. Uh, the, the thing, what, what can we do though? What can we push back on here? Clearly, uh, we don't have control of the state legislature to prevent a lot of these things from happening. This is where it's really important for people to understand that our statewide elected position, positions are not gerrymandered. They were not impacted by redistricting. They are on a statewide basis. And if you make your vote count for pro-choice candidates, the governor has the ability, has the power of the veto. The uh, attorney general has the power of of, of implementing and deciphering and giving opinions on law. Uh, and certainly the Lieutenant Governor has the power of the agenda. So there are ways that people could affect change more immediately than, than, than I think we can do with our legislative body by looking at our statewide elected officials and making sure that we get people in place that are going to do what they can to prevent some of the, the negative things that are coming down the pipe here and, and make sure that we start moving toward renewing those kinds of, of statutes that are going to support women in their decisions about their own bodies and their own futures. Thank you. Um, and that's also a nice segue to thinking about other, if, it, if, if it's not the Texas legislature or maybe the state elected officials, um, what might be able to be done at a federal level, um, particularly with its potential um, for maybe preempting some of the, this possible future state legislation that you just spoke about. So I'll turn with to Congressman Doggett then, and um, you too have long been a strong supporter of reproductive justice. Um, and most recently, even before the Dobbs decision, you spoke out against SBA, and similar laws across the country. Um, I'd like to start by thinking about what can be done so we can look at different levels of federal action, but I'd like to start with uh, Congress. And you were a sponsor of the Women's Health Protection Act um, or the WHPA, which unfortunately, but expectedly did not move out of the Senate. Um, you have served in Congress for over 25 years. You're the chair of the Health Subcommittee on the House Ways and Means Committee. Um, it would be great if, based on your experience, you could share with us what you see as some of the most promising possibilities for federal legislation regarding abortion access, um, as well as legislation regarding other aspects of reproductive care. Um, and, and you've spoken about many of the same issues um, that Representative Howard just did in terms of, in terms of reproductive health more broadly. Um, so, any plans to put forth some legislation or a co-sponsor? Oh, indeed. And let me just say, Professor, at the outset that uh, Sissy Ferenthal was a personal friend and she was an inspiration to so many of us for decades. And I think it's wonderful that this roundtable is being done in her name because she was a woman who was always stirring up trouble, uh, the type of trouble that my friend, the late John Lewis, always referred to as good trouble. And I know that. Uh, she would very much want to be a part of what we're doing today. Uh, of course, all that we are encountering as uh, Representative Howard and Council Member of Fuentes have eloquently commented is bad trouble. And while we must never give up on finding ways to overcome that bad trouble, I think we face two very significant realities as it relates to Congress and to the federal government. Nothing short of legislation will fill all of the void that has been created by this appalling Dobbs decision. And second, no legislation of any type, no matter how modest and incomplete that it may be, is likely to be approved by the Congress without changing some votes in the Senate. As purported champions of a woman's right to choose, Senator Kirsten uh, Jill Brandt, Kirsten Cinema, excuse me, not uh, and Susan Collins 
could lead the way in offering a narrow carve out of the filibuster to codify the right to an abortion and reproductive health care and many of the other issues we're talking about. With that, without them taking that action, no legislation will get approved. And without that action, uh, I really think their statement that they're pro-choice and for reproductive freedom is rendered essentially meaningless, just talk. Uh, we need every person to demand that these two women stand up for women. That's uh, not to remove the focus on anyone else in the Senate, but particularly two people who say they're pro-choice could write all the guarantees that we're talking about today of Roe in the statutory law and get it approved next week if they were willing to do so. Uh, on the specifics, uh, yes, I have been, actually my commitment on this issue goes back to my days as a Texas state senator. And then I wrote about it when I was on the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, but the Women's Health Protection Act, we approved, I was a sponsor of it last September. Uh, it writes Roe against Wade into law and it enshrines a federal right to abortion and reproductive justice. That same bill will be before the House in the next couple of days this week. Uh, it is the same language with only some changes to the findings section to reflect what has happened in the meantime. Uh, we will also on the same day vote on a measure called the Ensuring Access to Abortion Act by my friend Lizzie Fletcher from Houston that will prohibit any person under color of state law private or public from uh, punishing Americans who travel for reproductive health care and will create a private cause of action for them. It also empowers the attorney general to bring a civil action to stop this. Uh, I am also the sponsor, uh, in addition to those two bills, of five other pending bills. Two of them deal with data and Speaker Pelosi has said that in some form they will probably come before us this month the Stop Abortion Discrimination Act, which would empower the FTC to stop uh, false advertising by the so-called crisis pregnancy centers. And then the My Body, My Data Act, which places some strong protections on what health data may be collected and how it may be used concerning reproduction and sexual health. Uh, in addition to those, there are two more, the EACH Act, which is designed to ensure all forms of health insurance cover abortion care and a bill to provide comprehensive sex education and family planning counsel, uh, counseling, uh, as well as a bill uh, called the ABC Act, which is designed to access all forms of contraception. Uh, what Representative Howard said about the broader health issue is so very important. Uh, it is appalling that Texas does so little uh, for mothers and for infants uh, and young children. It's not pro-life, it's just pro-mandatory motherhood. Uh, and uh, to, for Texas to only extend this maternal health care for six months from two months is pretty modest. Uh, I have made uh, trying to get that covered uh, and expansion of Medicaid in Texas, uh, which has not happened despite the efforts of Representative Howard and so many other of our colleagues in the House and Senate, uh, but uh, that is a top priority. And we still have some hope of getting that into whatever is left to build back better. I think it's now called Build Back Mansion, uh, whatever he'll agree to uh, in, the, in the waiting days of this uh, session before the August recess. So that's pretty much the legislative agenda, but it all faces the same fate if we can't get some exception uh, for this critical issue. Um, yeah, it's, I thank you for that. And I, I was going to ask a follow up on the filibuster. Um, maybe I just ask, is there one, do you think any of these bills might have a chance since they're, is that part of why they're broken down into separate bills without the filib um, ending the filibuster? Or is there any other hope for carving out that exception? I do not I understand that without a narrow exception to the filibuster, you have to find 10 Republicans to go along with all Democrats. And I think, you know, Joe Manchin is not exactly a pro-choice Democrat. He's probably the only one who has raised questions about our basic commitment on these issues. And so that's why an exception to the filibuster is night and day. And anything that is designed 
to advance, uh, humanize any aspect of abortion will be rejected on a party line vote plus maybe Joe Manchin. And if you don't get uh, an exception to the filibuster, nothing happens. The only exception in this area are some of the similar uh, the healthcare matters that are similar to what Representative Howard mentioned, which we so much need uh, at the federal and the state level to do more to to be really pro-life for those who are born and their mothers who face very difficult circumstances in Texas if they're poor people, because there's so little social safety net, it's all whole and no net in Texas. Well, maybe because of those concerns and that big obstacle, a number of members of Congress have been turning to the executive. Um, so maybe we can go there for a moment. Um, you have been working with Senator Warren and others to push President Biden to take certain measures within his power. Um, and on Friday, he issued an executive order. Um, could you talk about which strategies, whether or not they're covered by the order you think might be the most promising at the moment? and the most likely to, and I'll use the preemptive word again, um, anti-abortion state laws. Um, and a couple that I know you've spoken about and thought about that you might address specifically are thoughts on the advantages or disadvantages of declaring a public health emergency, which of course was not in the order, um, and what might be done to protect uh, access to medication abortion. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, you know, I think, from, I'm pleased that there was an announcement finally on Friday. It was belated uh, from the leaking, the credible leaking of this opinion. We knew what was coming. And I believe that the president should have been better prepared with immediate issuance of the most expansive executive order possible. And that's not what we got on Friday. Friday was constructive, but insufficient in my opinion. Uh, it directs uh, Health and Human Services to take uh, action to expand medical abortion is certainly important, uh, ensure emergency medical care for those who are pregnant, and some other public outreach and education. Uh, I believe that we do need definitely a public health emergency declaration. Uh, and I am leading a letter that I wrote that has been joined by Representative Fletcher. And as of the beginning of this program, which I was a little late getting into, I think we're just a little over 40 of our Democratic colleagues joining with us all urging President Biden to issue a national emergency declaration and a public health emergency declaration on abortion access and to use authorities under what's called the PREP Act to seek continued access to medication abortion. Uh, this letter that we are working on has been endorsed by the Center for Reproductive Rights, by NARAL, and by Planned Parenthood. Uh, this declaration, I think, would first make clear uh, what so many women in our country already know, and that is that this is a real life emergency. Uh, and it is the result of a sudden and unexpected reversal of 50 years of well-established law. And it's left so many people, particularly poor people, in a very difficult position. The PREP Act that I refer to was signed into law by President George W. Bush back in 2005. And it was to grant drug makers immunity from legal action uh, in their uh, production of uh, any medical countermeasures against chemical, biological, or radiological uh, epidemics and pandemics and terrorism. Uh, I think it could be used to permit people in Texas to access care outside Texas by granting immunity to healthcare providers who deliver those services, such as medication abortion. Uh, such uh, use of the PREP Act in connection with an emergency declaration will undoubtedly be challenged in court as outside the scope of the original law. Uh, but just as uh, Council Member Fuentes said about the city not waiting to see what the state will do to impede its action, we cannot allow the most narrow-minded Trump-appointed federal judge in Texas, of which there are too many, to prevent our trying. Uh, I think even if some of the federal emergency authorities pertaining to abortion access were disputed or overturned in the courts, that the national emergency could still serve as a powerful tool to help providers, mainly in states where abortion is legal, 
to work together in handling the influx of patients from states like ours where abortion is criminalized. Uh, and I noted, Representative Howard, that one of your colleagues is so committed to life that he wants to impose capital punishment on those uh, who are engaged in getting or assisting in an abortion. It's an amazing contradiction. Uh, as far as medication abortion uh, is concerned, I think it does offer the greatest access point for care across the states. One of the other things this administration should be doing is uh, intervening uh, in the case uh, that has been brought against Mississippi, which has, Mississippi is trying to prohibit medication abortion in the state. Uh, there's not a past example of a state prohibiting access to an FDA approved drug. Uh, the drug manufacturer is suing the state of Mississippi and, and the Department of Justice needs to be involved. Uh, about this, it's not the Postal Service that regulates what can be mailed and not the states. Uh, separately, I think Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice uh, should remain committed to defending the rights of providers and patients to use telehealth for the prescription of medication abortion under a public health emergency. Health and Human Services, I think, can use the PrEP Act until some court tells them they cannot to assist providers to practice across state lines without having their medical license impaired uh, by any state. Uh, I guess that's a, a short, not so short response. I know the PREP Act and the emergency is not a, a silver bullet, but I think it is a step further than the administration is taking. And I hope that our letter and similar efforts by Senator Warren uh, and some of her Senate colleagues will help us get the administration to that point. Right, thank you. Um, and that does sound, that's the one of the most promising arguments I've heard for the public health emergency declaration. Um, although I will say Rachel Rebouche has also been talking about that. So it's a good way to bring you um, in, Professor Rebouche. Uh, you, um, I've already said a fair amount about the article that you all wrote um, and that really was a quite expansive view of the landscape and we'll talk about more of it uh, next week as well. Um, but you and your co-authors, other than writing that article, you've also been writing a lot of op-eds um, and you too have been pushing the Biden administration um, to take federal action or encouraging and working with some of the members of Congress uh, who are doing that as well. Um, so I wonder if there's anything that you, find particularly promising that we haven't talked about, that we haven't talked about yet. Um, and whether it's through the executive order or some other way, what more would you propose? Thank you. And I, I just have to say thank you to Karen, to Professor Engel for putting this uh, panel together. And I am so grateful for the work of Councilmember Fuentes, Representative Power and Congressman Doggett. I'm a native Texan, as Karen said. I graduated from college in San Antonio, grew up in Oak Cliff in South Dallas, and I um, just really want to thank you for all your incredibly courageous and, um, and wonderful work. Um, so yeah, I'll just put a few things on the table that haven't been mentioned. Um, as Karen mentioned, this is uh, draws from work that I've done with two wonderful colleagues, law professors, David Cullen at Drexel Law and Greer Donnelly at the University of Pitt, uh, Pittsburgh. So one thing that was surfaced in the executive order uh, was this 30-day letter from Health and Human Services, but I think that uh, the Biden administration could ask for more. Uh, there is so much expertise in federal agencies. They are own complicated domains that directly and indirectly touch on abortion law and access. So I think there needs to be a more pointed demand that the head of each agency explore options for action so that President Biden can deploy that expertise of those who understand the complicated ways that the administrative state best receive, could best uh, further and advance fresh ideas that could help in big ways. So that's a kind of overarching uh, uh, idea that, that President Biden could initiate right away. In addition to uh, what the Congressman said, the FDA has the power and does not need permission to remove 
remaining restrictions on abortion pills. So mm -hmm. the FDA regulates very closely mifepristone, the first drug in a medication abortion. It requires certified uh, providers to dispense it. It is going to enact a certification uh, process for pharmacies. Uh, it requires a duplicative informed consent process. The FDA could remove those restrictions called the RIMS and thus free up provision of medication abortion, which can now be mailed because the FDA revisited a rule that was medically unnecessary and thus broaden access across the country where it's legal, which could have indirect effects in other states where, um, where states have banned abortion. Um, I would add to the preemption argument uh, that uh, the Congressman talked about uh, uh, quickly. So this is the idea that the supremacy clause gives the federal government when it speaks on the issue, the power to speak exclusive of states when states don't have jurisdiction in the area. That preemption argument would be bolstered if the FDA invited administration would come out and strongly and firmly say that there is a preemption argument here. Um, as mentioned, they could intervene in these cases, but the first step would be to, as the Attorney General Garland made a nod toward, uh, really set the uh, set out the case for why the, when the Food and Drug Administration regulates mifepristone medication abortion and has regulated it as closely as it has for decades, that that uniform drug policy is the drug policy that preempts state policies. This is the same argument that would apply to other federal statutes. So not just agency rules and regulation, but federal statutes like EMTALA, which requires uh, providers of emergency care to treat, uh, 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 to offer abortion if that is the, uh, the care uh, demanded in a medical emergency. HIPAA uh, are the privacy protections that require uh, privacy, the patient privacy protected unless there is a subpoena or another legal document that uh, requires that healthcare provider uh, uh, submit a, pri a patient's private information. And then I just one quickly, because I, I, I know we're going to run out of time, but this has been a controversial suggestion that we've made and we know it's problematic. I'm happy to talk about why, but the Biden administration could think about uh, what abortion provision on federal lands and in federal health care centers looks like. On federal lands, um, this is a uh, um, the idea that federal enclaves are exclusive jurisdiction of the federal government. It's um, a secure federal law known as the Assimilative Crimes Act that will adopt some state criminal law on federal land, but only when there's no federal policy to the contrary. Uh, with the FDA's regulation of medication abortion and other federal statutes that touch on abortion, there's at least the argument that state abortion bans applied to medication abortion should not apply to federal land. And even if state law applied, federal prosecutors control prosecutions on that federal land. So the Biden administration could choose not to prosecute them. I'm, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what's risky and what's uncertain and logistically difficult about that, uh, that option, but it's, it's on the table. And then the government provides health care. It provides uh, health care through VA hospitals, federally qualified health centers. Uh, the Hyde Amendment does not uh, permit the federal government to pay for abortion outside of threat to life and in the instance of rape and incest. But still, that, those are exceptions that some states have not included in their abortion bans. And so there's at least a small sliver of abortions that fit within those exceptions. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Um, I did have a follow-up question with you on the enclaves, um, but maybe we'll we'll save that for next week if as a way to get everybody back here. Um, and just to say, there are quite a few questions in the chat. And actually, I, I think maybe we should spend the last few minutes um, going there. And so I don't know if the panelists are able to see them. Um, some requests we can deal with after the fact. We'll obviously share all the questions with you. Someone's wanting detailed information on top 10 things that a citizen can do, which is a great question. Um, and I think uh, we can put our heads together um, and also maybe uh, discuss that more next week. Um, one of the concerns 
does seem to be about backlash, which would really take us back to Council Member Fuentes's opening remarks. And I think, you know, everyone really touched on it. Um, so maybe I'll just say, if there's specific questions you want to address, um, that's great. But also, if there are any lessons that you all have learned from responses to SB8, um, or if there's anything you want to say to the other panelists um, in terms of ways in which you all might work together, be thinking together, um, I think that would be great. So I think I'll just have these last few minutes be a bit of a free for all. So give everyone two to three minutes. Um, and starting with, we'll go, we'll go back now, starting with Congressman Doggett. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, first, we do have among uh, with, with Representative Howard, Representative Wentis, a good uh, arrangement of sharing information. I count on Representative Howard on everything about health care and about state appropriations, and we're very fortunate to have her in the position she's in. Uh, I guess the place I would go uh, is more for some of your listeners because I hear the campaign about having days of rage. And I understand the rage and the anger and I share it. But the one thing that ultimately will make a difference in a democratic process is if we have days of action. Uh, and I know Representative Howard, you, you're planning a day of action that I look forward to, to joining you on. Uh, but we have to make changes in the elected officials who do not share our commitment to reproductive freedom and who fail to recognize that abortion is health care. We have very limited opportunities to really make a difference in the state of Texas this year. Because of redistricting, Representative Howard has made the strong and important case that we do at the statewide level. And that's the place. The 10 things I would tell people that they need to do are the same thing over 10 times. And that is to be engaged to help us make that change. And of course, as I said at the outset, anyone who has contacts in Arizona or Maine who can influence either of the two purported pro-choice champions in the Senate to make that narrow exception, that's our only hope for getting federal action. I think overall, we need to keep up uh, the contact with the Biden administration. I was taking notes when the professor was talking about FDA and will be listening next week because we need to to be as creative as possible and look for every opportunity, uh, not forsake any opportunity as a way to do something about the very difficult situation that we're in. Thank you. Uh, Representative Howard. There's just so much to cram in here, but um, certainly I was very intrigued by the FDA part too. Um, you know, we, we, we also passed, besides Senate Bill 8, Senate Bill 4, which uh, prevented the use of medication abortions after seven weeks gestation, even though uh, that was much less than what FDA has approved for use of these medications, as well as preventing mailing of these medications. But as Congressman Doggett points out, uh, the post office is, the Postal Service is a, a federal uh, entity that hopefully would have uh, a preemptive say over what gets mailed or doesn't get mailed. I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. I just know that these things have got to be looked at and what can be done to prevent the states from being rogue on these things that shouldn't be in place. To tell somebody that they can't mail something, to tell somebody they cannot go out of state. Um, I've actually heard one of the arguments for how they would do the prevention of, of going out of state and coming back into the state is if they take the second medication uh, medication for abortion once they get back to Texas. And because they're considering uh, the fetus to be uh, a, an entity, a human being, uh, that that would then be human trafficking, something to that. I mean, this is mind boggling what they're, they're looking at here. But let's remember, this was 50 years in the making, basically a half century of working strategically to get to this point of electing the people who were put in positions to make judicial appointments that would allow this to happen, that, that incrementally eroded uh, what was available for people seeking abortion. It is not gonna change overnight. I wish there were a magic answer here and there's not, but we have got to look at all the things that have been talked about here and start 
incrementally working toward uh, doing whatever we can to minimize the damage being done in states. And let me say, this is not just about seeking uh, so-called elective abortions. We're talking about consequences to people who actually want to have their pregnancy, but have complications that occur. And this law is impacting the medical interventions being done for those people. We have stories of, of women having to travel out of state who had ectopic pregnancies, who had fetal abnormalities because the physician was concerned about the ambiguities that exist and what, what's been proposed here and the threat of losing their license, their livelihood, and perhaps even having criminal penalties. This is huge what's going on now. And so I think all the things that are being talked about, yes, all of the above. Let's work on this together. I appreciate Councilwoman Fuentes and what they're doing locally. Uh, certainly Congressman Doggett and whatever can, who we can help we can get at the federal level. I will tell you, being in the state legislature right now, it is extremely frustrating that the, that the Supreme Court of Texas turned its back on us and that Congress has been unable to put things in place to protect us as well. And I am so grateful for the efforts that are being made. Um, and we just have to continue to work together on this, all hands on deck, everything, of the, all of the above. We got to put everything in place that we can. I just want to reiterate basically the ways in which you just told us how the anti-abortion legislatures have been thinking very creatively. And so I, that's like partly in response to the backlash questions. And I know Council Member Fuentes already started to address this, but um, the response has to be creative thinking, strate strat strategies, and, and just to say that's, that's really why we're having these couple of events, these roundtables, and hope that they're just the beginning. Um, and I think people are, are out there doing it, but a lot of what has happened with the ambiguity is that with that comes threats, like with the letter that you shared with us earlier today. Um, so maybe we'll end then with you, Council Member Fuentes, trying to give a little bit of some certainty maybe within, within Austin and uh, your realm, your sphere. Thank you. you know, as I shared earlier, next week, City Council is having a special called meeting to consider the GRACE Act, which is our effort to decriminalize abortion here locally, as well as to update the city's non-discrimination ordinance to include protections for reproductive health decisions. Um, I also wanted to mention the mayor is bringing forward another policy that is around a public education campaign around vasectomies as well. Uh, so we really are thinking through what is every single thing that we can do. Um, to help at, during this time, I myself have engaged in meetings and conversations with airline carriers, you know, talking about, you know, setting up uh, routes for folks to get to safe haven states or to haven states um, and, and meeting with other council members throughout the state who also represent airports and seeing what we can leverage and push strategically uh, to ensure that we can um, have that level of coordination. It, these are conversations that you, that I would have never anticipated having at this time, but these are conversations that are going on because we believe that we have to have no stone left unturned and we will continue to do all that we can to fight for protections and and to fight back and so that's just a little bit of what we're doing here locally uh, certainly if you uh, this roundtable was uh, very uh, enlightening for me personally as well because it now has kind of perked a few other ideas of, of areas to pursue and so I welcome any additional conversations and, and dialogues that we can have. All right. Um, thank you all very much. I, we've gone a few minutes over. Um, I do want to say the audience doesn't realize that there have been about 150 people on today between YouTube and um, Zoom. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week uh, as we continue this discussion and thinking more about what the possibilities are for going outside of state. Um, for women in Texas, and particularly women without means in Texas. Um, and Rachel will be back with us for that. And maybe we'll have a few federal enclaves um, carved out by then. Uh, thank you all again, not just for your participation today, but for the great work you do. And we hope to stay in touch. I think Sissy would want that and would be very pleased with this discussion, even though very angry at the situation. So. Thank you. Take care.
Thank you.